sometimes I'll catch myself saying, I hope I make it through the prayer without breaking down or weeping or something, you know. Um, there are, it's not, no, that's not every time, right, that I celebrate the Mass, but there are those moments. I think I'm most fully myself when I'm at prayer, and especially most fully myself when I'm, when I'm celebrating Mass. Well, Your Grace, we're back in the studio after we summer are back break. In the studio, did you have a summer break? I did I have was, a summer break. Okay, yeah, I just got back a couple days ago. I think it was. Yeah, at yeah. the time of this recording, you just getting back from Scotland. I just got back. From, well, I, I just got back from two Scotlands. Oh, old and new. Oh, so I grew up in New Scotland, Nova Scotia. Right. Oh, okay. Oh. So I went there. <laughs> you had me there. I, I was intrigued. <laughs> now, folks, it is very rare that I catch. <laughs> Jenny like that. So, oh no, yeah. you catch me quite a bit. I just have a you know a steely face. I don't let the surprise uh, show. Uh, okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. <laughs> uh, no, I went to um, well to visit family, obviously in Nova Scotia, and then from there I met up with a friend and went over to uh, Scotland. So I was there for about nine full days. And a lot of it was in Glasgow and then in Edinburgh, but also rented a car, drove around, saw. I'd, I'd say probably the highlights just to give me a sense of the country. Beautiful, beautiful. And beautiful people. They were just, everybody was so anxious and ready to help. If they were over, heard us in a line and realized we were away, I'd, have you seen this? And here's how you get such and such a place. Really good. So glad to be there. Did you have a, gu- a guide or a friend or a tour? One time, one time I did. Uh, we made our way over to the island of Iona, the place of uh, St. Columba. And I wanted to make sure we get a sense of that place. So we did... Uh, uh, engage a guide to lead us through that. But a part of it, apart from that, it was all self-made. So I figured out. Now, there was one time I wanted to go to the western coast, the, the, the western highlands and the, the, the wild coastal regions of Scotland. And had a certain itinerary in mind, but went to the lady at the counter of the hotel where we were staying for some advice. And she said, you got to go such and such a place, uh, Apple Cross. It wasn't, it wasn't on my itinerary, but she was so insistent, so beautiful. She, okay, so we went. Wholesome name, Apple Cross. Apple Cross. And to get there, you go through the Apple Cross Passage, they call it. Okay. So this is, so it's, you go up a high, high mountain, stunning scenery, and drove over the mountain, down towards the coast, other scenery. Made it halfway. Um, because the roads, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why I keep doing this to myself or doing this to other people. Are you driving? I'm driving. Okay. Uh, wrong side of the car, wrong oh, side of the road, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we're going up these twisty mountains, great heights, sometimes a guardrail, sometimes not. One lane, yeah. two-way traffic. <laughs> yeah. Now, the two-way traffic is more suited to goats than to cars. And so you get the little pull-out spaces. <laughs> I've tried this. And um, by the time we got to the top, the fog had rolled in, and it was so, so thick I couldn't see you know, as far as the end of that table. So that's a little dangerous. So we made her turn around, went back. But glad we did it. It's just what we could see um, <laughs> when I could concentrate on the on the scenery around us was truly, truly beautiful. So I was glad, glad to get over there. Do you meet a lot of priests and, or even other Not necessarily. I, I know the Archbishop of um, Edinburgh, so I was able to connect with him okay. uh, when I was there. But apart from that, no, I don't know, don't know the other bishops. One, um, one place I did go to was the Cathedral of Glasgow because a friend of mine was the Archbishop of Glasgow. In fact, he oh. led one of our priest retreats. He died during COVID, tragically. What's his name? Uh, Philip Tartaglia, Archbishop Tartaglia. So I wanted to go to his cathedral and honor him there. So I did that. They did a beautiful renovation there over the last few few years. But apart from that, no, I don't know the clergy there at all. So when you're celebrating, when you're traveling, do you celebrate Mass on your own as yeah. opposed to, okay, Yeah, bring a Mass kit to... to make sure that I can celebrate Mass every day because you can't always get into churches. They might be locked or can't yeah. find people. So just want to make sure that we're able to offer the sacrifice daily. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Where, where, where did you go? Did you? Well, I, I had vacation, but uh, actually the biggest vacation that I took was a nine-day healing retreat, a silent oh. retreat in Calgary. So it wasn't even, uh, it wasn't far away, but it was... Really right. beautiful experience. Good. Yeah, it's called Triumph. It was, yeah, it was definitely a life, oh, life-changing that. experience. Well, yeah, it was good. Great. Good yeah, for you. Unconventional vacation. No no Scotland or Mexico or anything like that, but a retreat was really, oh, really a you, blessing. Oh, but you scaled heights far higher than I did, I'm sure. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, it's well a good done. way of putting it. Good for you. So today we're, we're releasing this episode just a few days after the Archdiocese has been introduced to the three new pastoral priorities. Oh, right. 
And we're focusing today on pastoral priority number one, which is Eucharistic formation. Mm -hmm. Can you give a bit of context of what are these three new pastoral priorities and uh, why have we specifically chosen Euch Eucharistic formation as number one? Sure, sure. Well, the background is basically the synodal process. So you recall that Pope Francis invited the church universally to enter into a synodal process of listening. Every diocese was invited into that, so we participated. And over the space of, I forget the amount of time, we had about 350 listening sessions, 4,000 responses. And common to all of that was a request for formation in the faith. So we take that very seriously and how to structure it. Back in 2017, I uh, issued a first version of a pastoral letter about what it is to be a disciple of Christ, one who hears the word of God and does it. Living it. in the word. That's it. Yeah. And the way we historically, traditionally, as Catholics do the word is threefold, worship, witness, and service. So how about if we structure our formation efforts over the next three years around those three pillars of the Catholic life? Uh, so that's that's where we are. So around worship, well, our central act of worship clearly is the Eucharist. Um, and people want to know a little bit more about, a lot more about the Eucharist. And sometimes they get a sense that perhaps our understanding of the Eucharist, our fundamental belief in the wondrous sacrament that that is, might be waning a little bit. So let's double down on that. Also around witness, what our people are asking, help us to be confident witnesses before the world today, that we can point to Christ, that we can defend the faith, celebrate the faith, and so on. And then service. Uh, the Archdiocese is not well known for being dedicated to service in so, so many ways over the years. But is there a particular area that we might want to focus upon at this time? And so we're, we're going to focus upon service to marriage and family. Right. That's that's the cell of the church, it's the cell of society. It's under a lot of pressure these days, so let's take a look at, at that. So that's in, uh, in a nutshell, in a nutshell uh, why, we, why we are where we are. We're going into formation mode, really, over the next three years around those three pillars. Mm -hmm. So the idea of these pastoral priorities is to form our archdiocesan community in these three areas. Precisely. So they are formation priorities, yep. specifically. They are that. Okay, that's interesting. And so why Eucharistic, is there significance to the Eucharistic formation being number one? And also, uh, is there significance to it being Eucharistic formation as opposed to, more broadly speaking, liturgical formation or theological formation? So a couple of things. When we talk about the Eucharist being first, I think we need to stress that this the, these three are going to carry on simultaneously. It's not that we do one one year, another a second year, all three as we're moving forward over the next three years. But the Eucharist has its priority over all aspects of, of Catholic life because as the church herself teaches, it is the source and the summit of the entire Christian life. And so uh, this is the place of privilege, supreme encounter with Jesus Christ truly present in the transformed gifts of, body and, of bread and wine. And from the Eucharist, we're sent forth to give witness. From the Eucharist, we're sent forth in service. And, and then from our lived experience of witnessing to Christ and serving one another in love, we bring that all back to the Eucharist, right, to offer that through Christ to the Father. So it is the foundation, it is the center, it is the source, it's the summit, it's everything. Uh, it's truly our breath as a Christian people. We really cannot live without the Eucharist, Think otherwise, we're deluding ourselves. And so because it is the center of everything, we want to give that, we make that the first priority. And I want over time for our people to see how that really does infuse everything else that we seek to do as followers of Christ uh, with his grace. Growing up in the Catholic Church, for me, I certainly have witnessed healings, uh, in the presence of the Eucharist, I've seen people have conversions because mm. of the Eucharist. You see so many different um, expressions of the Mass, even though it's all Roman Catholic liturgies. You see d different ways of of presenting the liturgy, and there's so there's basically so many different encounters with the Eucharist that are extraordinary, and I have experienced that. When you look through your life. Do you have some particular memories of seeing the power of the Eucharist, whether it's spiritual healings or physical healings, or whether it was just moments of being struck by the beauty of 
Eucharistic adoration or the Mass? I would say probably for myself it's the latter. Um, like yourself, I grew up in the church. Sunday Mass was just what we did as, as a family and as individuals. And now that I'm ordained a priest and bishop, I'd have to say, how would I put it? I think I'm most fully myself when I'm at prayer, and especially most fully myself when I'm, when I'm celebrating Mass. And within that, I, I would just say that my own experience is being there as the presider, being there and surrounded by the people of God, being there listening to the Word of God, being there when, when we know that the bread and the wine are transformed into the true body and blood of the Lord, I just sometimes find myself profoundly moved, profoundly touched by, it could be a word from the sacred scripture, it could be something from the prayer. Sometimes I, I, I find I've, I've got to be careful not to let the voice crack, you know, um, when I'm offering the Eucharistic prayer, when I think of really what is in the midst of us, what is before us, who is before us, and the prayer that's being offered. Jesus is truly present in his act of offering himself to the Father. You know, what was done once for all on the cross at Calvary, just think of that, is rendered present in the here and now of the Mass on the altar so that we can, together with Jesus, offer our lives to the Father. And so um, a way that sometimes people will put it, and I, I think I have too a couple of times, is placing myself together with the host on the patent, placing the people of God on the patent, people who have asked for my prayers or the people that I know are struggling or just the needs of the archdiocese, put it on the patent so that we're all together with Christ offering to the Father so that we can live from the response of the Father. Sometimes I think we, we, we can forget, maybe not even think of the presence and the action of our Heavenly Father in the Eucharist. So Jesus is there offering himself to the Father, but it is Jesus, the risen Lord, Jesus in his victory over death. So what is also rendered present at, in the Eucharist is the response of the Father to the self-offering of his Son, the response of resurrection, the response of new life, the response of hope. And so when we offer ourselves through Christ to the Father, we, we are entering into communion, yes, with Jesus, but also with the response of the Father living from the Father's all-powerful response of love and new life. And if that, if that doesn't inspire us with confidence and hope, what can? And so sometimes just in that moment, by God's grace, obviously, but sensing what's, what's happening in, in, in the, those prayers of offering as part of the Eucharistic prayer, sometimes I'll catch myself saying, I hope I make it through the prayer without breaking down or weeping or something, you know, um, there are, it's not, no, that's not every time, right, that I celebrate the Mass, but there are those moments. Um, and then to know, to know how the Word of God is connecting with me in whatever I'm experiencing in my own you know, journey with Christ, or whatever I'm learning about what's happening in the lives of other people, and just hearing the answer proclaimed, hearing the answer proclaimed as, as the Word of God is proclaimed at Mass. And knowing that people are going in so, so many different directions for answers. It's all here. Why are you searching elsewhere? It's all here. Listen to the word. Come to know Jesus, the word incarnate. It's all here. And to be touched by that sometimes in the awareness. It, you can see I'm struggling with the words on this because it's beyond words, really, this experience of, of Mass. So anyway, just to answer your question, that's, that's no... I don't know what, no lightning bolts, you know, but just this awareness of the beauty and the mystery and the wonder of what the Eucharist is. Transubstantiation. This is a Catholic word. What does it mean in relation to the Eucharist? And how does it express something distinct from a symbolic view of the Eucharist? Okay, so, well, um, maybe in a future episode we can get into some more specifics around what we mean entirely, but transubstantiation. But uh, I think uh, for right now, let's say that it, it does mean that there is true change 
in the bread and the wine. Uh, so the bread and wine are not just symbolic of some other reality. Right? Um, they truly do become the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God made flesh. So this this is the heart of, of what we believe and proclaim. Um, they're not just symbols. It becomes the it becomes the Lord, the bread and the wine become the Lord Himself. Mm-hmm. Hence, why you th- I think of the stories of a lot of the uh, the martyrs at the beginning of the church mm-hmm. during a lot of the Roman persecutions, and there's one saint. We'll have to fact check who it was, but he was tra- traveling with the Eucharist. Mm. He had to transport it from one area to another, and then he was attacked. Mm. But he and he protected this one host close to his heart and died because of it because he was treating it as the real presence. You yes. know, he didn't die. He's like, oh, it's, I'll just drop it to the side because it's a symbol, right? Like it'll yeah. just, it can decompose. Yeah. He treated it like he was holding a baby or mm-hmm. holding God. Yeah. Well, it, and it's, it's a testimony to the fact that from the beginning, the church has held this. Now, the way it has expressed this change um, uh, has developed over time. So, for example, it's with Thomas Aquinas that we received that particular term, transubstantiation. Oh, he's the one that originated yeah, that. But from the very, very beginning, the church has held that this is the real presence of Jesus himself. Mm-hmm. Going back to the fact that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he is the one through whom all things were made. So we know that from the accounts of creation, when God spoke, things came to be. So God has that power by the mere fact of his word to create and to recreate. And Jesus, uh, the one through whom all things were made, when he speaks, things happen. So his word, this is my body, this is my blood. It's, It's not, it doesn't rest just at the symbolic level. It's the word of God that is being spoken brings about the change. So that's partly why, it's exactly why in a Catholic Mass, during the Mass, we would seek to be very careful that there's no particles from the Eucharist dropping on the ground. Like when you're receiving, you don't want it to fall or stick to your hand. Every particle is. God. There it is. (laughs) Yeah. So Never ceases to be extraordinary when you say it. I know. Every little particle is God. Sure. Sure. Wow. 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 What a gift. Yeah. What advice would you give someone if, very practical question, we're receiving communion, and maybe someone receives communion, especially in the hand, and maybe they don't know that it's the true body and blood of Christ. Sometimes that happens, right? At a Mass, there's lots of people, and maybe they walk away, and there's concern. I actually had someone ask me this recently. They said, what what do you do if you're concerned that someone might even with goodwill, just say, I'm not sure what this is. I'm going to take it to the pew or they're, they basically are not behaving as right. though it's the true presence right. of Jesus right. Christ. Um, what do you do in that scenario? Well, um, I think we have to be very careful. It's, it's th- these are delicate moments. Mm-hmm. However, we do have profound respect for the truth of the sacrament, for the truth of the Eucharist. And so if we see a, a young person, for example, walking away, not quite sure what to do, um, the the proper thing would be um, that needs to be consumed right away, right? Mm. Then afterwards, where it's possible, have a conversation with the individual. Do do you, do you realize what happened here? Um, in the light of that, is it appropriate that you would, had, had come forward in the way that you did, or perhaps the next time you may want to reconsider? So, I think we need to. Uh, deal with these things res- out of respect for the Eucharist as, as well as out of respect for the person, you know, dealing dealing with it uh, properly but, but delicately. And in an ideal scenario, the Eucharistic minister, the extraordinary minister, would be aware of this and they would be the one to intervene too. Oh, sure. oh re- yep. you need to receive this. You can't, exactly. you don't, don't walk exactly. away. You know? Yeah. And there can be moments when someone comes forward and you you, you see that they're they're hesitant. Yeah. So it's probably an indication that um, maybe they haven't been to Mass in a long time, maybe uh, maybe they're not Catholic, not quite sure what to do, then it's perfectly appropriate at that point to say, you know, are, are you Catholic? You know, is it appropriate for you to receive? Uh, and if not, then, again, always respectfully, lovingly, well, perhaps the 
the, the appropriate thing at this point is to receive a blessing. Um, and then there, if please God, there'd be an opportunity afterwards to explain that again, respectfully uh, to the person. Speaking of receiving the Eucharist, it's a unique element of Catholic practice and teaching that only practicing Catholics in a state of grace are invited to receive the Eucharist. Otherwise, there's an opportunity for a blessing, uh, an opportunity to go to confession, you know, re- return to a state of grace, and then at a, at a future Mass receive the Eucharist. Why, within the Catholic Church, do we believe that only a practicing Catholic in a state of grace should receive the Eucharist? It all goes back to the Generally teaching. Speaking. Yeah, it all goes back to the teaching of St. Paul. No. Matthew, you can fact check this. I think it's 1 Corinthians 11. He's giving some teaching on the Eucharist. And at one point he says, discern the body. Discern the body. And that, that has a, a double meaning, actually. Uh, I think in the first instance it means be aware of what this is, who this is, coming forward to receive none other than Jesus himself. Right. So in that light, discern the body also means discern your own life, right? What are you in? Are you in a a state, a condition of being apart from the communion of the church, such that it is not appropriate for you at this point to approach such a sacred moment and receive the the reception of holy communion symbolizes and brings about a deepening of the communion of the individual with the church, the body of Christ in in that sense. And so if one is aware that through their own actions, sometimes we'll call this very grave or mortal sin, they have broken that communion with the Lord and with his church, then it is not appropriate at that point to step forward and receive that sacrament, which symbolizes communion with the Lord, because that communion at that point does not exist. And that's why the church would say, you know, if you're aware of serious sin, a serious breakage you know, between you and the church, then that needs to be healed through the sacrament of confession before you approach and receive communion. Um, I, I think also that um, we need always to be aware of the need to discern the body, even if we're not aware of grave or mortal sin in our lives. We're all sinners. And we all, we, we all are approaching the Lord in that state. And I often go back in my mind, this is growing up in St. Michael's Parish in Halifax. There was a, a man there. He was a neighbor, but also a fellow parishioner. Very, very devout man. And I still remember seeing him a couple of times. I used to serve, altar as a young, serve the altar as a young guy. I would see him and others coming forward for communion. But my, mind, my, my eyes were often attracted to him because as he came forward, you could see him beating his breast and mouthing the words of an act of contrition. Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I mean, who is worthy to receive the Eucharist? And so I think even in those instances where we may not be aware of, of, of serious breakage through grave sin, we're all aware that we remain sinners. And this is nothing, this is something that can never be approached in a nonchalant fashion. We are coming having discerned the body as the body of Jesus and discerned our own bodies, if you will, as sinners. We are coming forward and need to need to be aware of that. We come forward, I think, humbly, I think uh, with contrition, but also with hope because we're approaching the throne of mercy, the throne of grace when we, when we receive Holy Communion in the Eucharist. So that's, generally speaking, what's behind that tradition. Discern the body. Discern the body. One could say... Well, I, receiving the Eucharist will do the healing. I'm broken from the body. I'm not in a state of grace. Couldn't receiving the Eucharist be the reconciliation that I'm seeking? Well, there is the gift of reconciliation and healing that does take place through the Eucharist. But the Church also says, again, remember, the sacraments are the gifts of Jesus himself to the Church. Mm-hmm. And we have to be very conscious that we never approach any of those sacraments as if they don't matter. Right? They all matter. And so we have this particular sacrament, the sacrament of penance, that has come to us from Jesus himself, which the church over time has discerned as a special gift for those instances where our breakage with the church is so severe it needs that special intervention, if I can put it that way. So yes, the Eucharist is always, there's always a healing 
dimension to it because we always need some degree of healing and reconciliation in our lives, sinners that we are, and tempted as we are, and vulnerable as we are uh, to the to the reality of sin. So, yes, but there's also this particular gift that the Lord has given that we we cannot treat as if it um, doesn't matter. So we need to be obedient. That's, sure. that's interesting that if you were to say, well, receiving the Eucharist in and, in and of itself will take care of any sin that needs to be forgiven. It's also in a sense saying I, confession is accidental. It's, it's yeah, unimportant because yeah, we can we just go to the Eucharist no, 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 instead. No, no. We have, and we have to be very careful too of the sin of presumption. Right? So I take it upon myself to discern what I need. Right? Um, so, Eucharist, that's going to be enough. Thanks very much. I don't need to go to confession. No, that's presumptuous. No, the Lord has given us the whole range of the sacraments. And so we need to um, act as if we're not, we, we can't treat them as pointless. Right? So. That's really interesting. I appreciate that. appreciate that. Another question I had was um, the Eucharist. Oh, actually, you know what? Before we move into what the Eucharist means, because it's an interesting word, and it's mm-hmm. not an English mm-hmm. word, but before we get into that, we were referring to a state of grace. What is a state of grace uh, for anyone who isn't aware of what that means in Catholic terms? Um, well, I, th- I think um, I think we have to be a little bit careful with it so that we're not getting into self-assessment, right? in mm-hmm. the sense that I'm in a state of grace. Thank you very much. Right. I don't I don't think I want to get into that degree of presumption. I know myself to be a sinner always in need of mercy. Um, basically, uh, what it's referring to is being unaware of any serious grave sin that has so ruptured my relationship with Christ and the church that it really is not appropriate for me to approach the Eucharist and to receive. We're always we're never perfect. Never perfect. So I think we have to be careful of that with that state of grace. We're never perfect. We're always on the road. We're always in need of deeper conversion and healing. Right. Um so it's it's that that's that basic sense of not being aware of something that has truly broken my relationship with Christ and the church. Right. As opposed to it's the distinction between venial and mortal sin. Yep. So it's losing yep. your st- a state of grace or being out of a state of grace would uh, indicate that you're in mortal sin. Like it's, it's, there's, well, there's, there's the there's, death of the soul. Is that a dramatic it, or over it's a, Well, I, again, we just have to be very careful of self judgment and, and self assessment. Only God understands, only God knows the heart. Uh, what we have to be aware of is where am I aware of that serious breach in my life mm-hmm. that needs particular intervention, the sacrament that needs healing before I am mm-hmm. approaching approaching the sacrament of the Eucharist. And the catechism, church teaching, gives us so much material in terms of helping us be aware of what is a grave matter, what constitutes a mortal sin, the catechism. There's a lot of rich teaching about if anyone's wondering, well, how do I know if this is a grave matter? There's a lot of... Yep. a lot of teaching on that. Yeah, and I think it's good to be referring to that again and again. We do have the gift of conscience, of course, um, but conscience needs to be formed and informed by the teaching of the church. And, and in many, many ways today, I think conscience needs to be evangelized because um, perhaps we've become, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a little bit numb to the reality of sin in the world today. It's, 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 it's a bit counterintuitive because as we look around, in many ways we can see that our world is thoroughly corrupted by sin. And yet at the same time, we'll see movements in society presenting as good what in fact is counter to God's commandments and to the natural law. And there's where I, I think we see a numbness to the reality of sin. And where that is the case, then I think we do need to be careful that we are not so judging ourselves as to be sinless uh, on on the basis of standards that are other than those of the gospel, other than those of the teaching of the church. So your point is well taken, that a constant referral to the catechism of the church and the wisdom of the church that's accumulated over two millennia right, is, is something that can really help inform the conscience and help us help us to live a, um, a humble, contrite, and yet reconciled and hopeful life. 
I like that phrase, the evangelization of the conscience. Yeah, I think there's a need right now for if that. If you're ever looking to write a book in your spare time. Sure. That's a good All one. Right, good title, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take that. Put that in your phone notes. <laughs> I've noticed that. I reflected on that a lot. The fact that right now, culturally, especially in Western American Canadian culture, sins, actions that we believe are truly destructive to the soul, even utterly destructive to the soul, are not even just being seen as okay, but they're actually being celebrated as warm and wonderful yeah. things that help the human being to flourish. And it's it's hard to have a well-informed conscience when you are in a culture that says, this isn't not, it's not only all right, this is actually the path. This is a good thing that will help you. It's hard. Well, St. Paul put it well when he said the Satan most often acts under the guise of an angel of light, taking what is bad and making it look very, very good. And I think we see that uh, running rampant today in many, many ways in our society. So Stay close to the word of God, stay close to the teaching of the church. Um, let that be the guide. Um, and be prepared to be challenged, to be prepared to be called to repentance, to be prepared to be called to new life and to live quite other, quite differently from that which is proposed as good and as the right path by many segments of our society today. What does the word Eucharist mean? means thanksgiving, comes from the, the Greek word eucharistain, to give thanks. So that's the heart of it. We are there uh, as a people of praise and making that sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, um, because we are celebrating God's greatest gift of all to us. We, we celebrate all of God's gifts, clear, clearly, but the greatest of all is the gift of his Son, the incarnation, the Paschal mystery, the passion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. His ascension that has given to us the hope of eternal life. That's the greatest thing possible, obviously. And um, that sacrifice by which Christ saved the world is sacramentally renewed every time we celebrate the Mass on the altar. So we how can our how can our attitude be anything other than humble and yet joyful? Thanks to God on whom the entirety of our lives, the entirety of our future depends radically. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. A Greek word uh -huh. that, we, that we've inherited into our Roman Catholic tradition. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've observed, and perhaps you've seen this too, culturally we are in a space where, um, how, how do I say it? We can often be very nonchalant in the face of serious things in life. Mm. There's There's a dismissal of of the whole concept of reverence, not just within religion, but if you look at something like the institution of marriage, people can be very, a lot of us are, are culturally, we can be flippant towards these things that used to be taken very seriously and seen as something that should be honored and reverenced. Uh, and this has sometimes seeped into how we approach the mass, right? Maybe we show up dressed like we do on any other day or, our attitude is one of distraction or we just don't have it. We don't take it with much seriousness, right? Despite the fact that we believe it's the true presence of Christ. If someone was seeking to increase their ability to be reverent and to honor the liturgy, to honor the Eucharist when they come to mass, what advice would you give them? Let's say, first of all, pray for the grace. All right, pray um, faith, reverence, Self-surrender, all of this is the working of God's grace in our lives, right? So we can't manufacture this on our own. So pray for that grace. Pray for that gift. Pay careful attention to how you prepare to come into the Mass. Um, so <laughs> don't be just charging at the last minute without having taken a look at the readings, without having given some prayerful, given some time for prayerful uh, preparation before you come to Mass just to be in that mindset of saying, okay, here, here is what is about to take place and this extraordinary blessing that we have to be able to be taking part in this. So I, I would say um, prepare well uh, and pray for that grace to, to enter into, as God would have us enter into the mystery of this uh, wondrous sacrament. Yeah, I've often thought about how being late for Mass, which we've all been in that place, less so the priest. <laughs> it's a little bit more problematic if the priest is really late. But we've all been in that position where we're rushing, we're showing up late, maybe we show up during the first reading. 
and I, I've thought, you know, at its worst, it could be a sign of, of disrespect or it's just showing that I, I'm not making it a priority or sometimes just life gets in the way, but. Or there's I, not enough space in the parking lot. I had to go elsewhere. True. I got to go. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of reasons, but at the same time, I've often thought of how if, if I show up late for mass and I've been consumed with whatever I was doing right up until the last minute, I'm not in a very receptive state. You know, it's not until mm. the liturgy of the Eucharist kicks in that I'm actually really present. Yep. I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate to the fact that they come in, it's been a bit of a whirlwind and they're not really mentally present until after the gospel or something, right. which if you show up even five, two minutes late, if you have that ability, it allows you to just rest in the spirit yep. and be present. Yeah. Yep. So if, if those, if those circumstances occur, you know, just, okay, I'm here, Lord, do, do with me what only you can do and bring me into this. But only you could make me focus right well, that, now. <laughs> that's, that's it. But I, I think too, um, you know, one of the, one of the, th the beautiful things that I've often seen as a, as a priest, as a bishop, are the young families that are coming to mass and they might be coming in a few minutes late, especially if it's the first mass of a Sunday. And, um, uh, I just, I'm just so filled with admiration for those parents. I'm thinking to myself, what did they have to go through to get those young kids up and ready? To, all, all the confusion and chaos that can happen in a house in the, in the morning, you know, and yet, and yet they're there. They, they have come. If they come a couple minutes late, fine. You know, That's uh, what I get, you, you know, for sure. I'm just so glad that you're there, right? Mm -hmm. So come on in and let's celebrate together this wondrous sacrament. Yeah, when we were growing up, I lived in a, we lived in this area in BC where you had to take a ferry, so we had to get up really oh early. It was dark, and then it was always the race with the eight children to eat breakfast <laughs> and get dressed, not to look bad, and then to catch the ferry because if you missed yeah. the ferry, then you couldn't go to mass yeah. at all. Wow, <laughs> well, frantic God, flurry! You know, is this good on your family? God bless my parents. You bet. You yeah, bet. they That's were wonderful. amazing. Great example. Well, would you be willing to close us in a prayer? Yeah, and I'm I'm certainly looking forward. I want want to say to the further conversations that we're going to have about this particular priority, as well as the others. I think this is going to be a grace-filled moment for the Archdiocese. Yeah, and people can go to katem.ca slash pastoral priorities if they want more information sure. about Good. the specifics. There's also, a few days ago, we launched a video introducing all three of the pastoral oh. priorities, so that's in the show notes. So there's a lot of information about how this is going to be rolling out in parishes and already has, so Great. it's an exciting season. Great. Okay, so let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks. You are the source of life. You are the source of all good gifts. And from you has come the gift of your Son, your Son incarnate of the Virgin Mary, your Son crucified and risen for our salvation, your Son who by the power of the Spirit is rendered present, truly present, in the wondrous gift of the Eucharist. We pray that your Holy Spirit be at work in our minds and in our hearts to deepen our awareness the wonder of this gift, the truth of this gift, deepen our reverence for it, deepen our desire for it, our, our, our zeal to be there and to participate in this, in this wonder. We pray in a particular way for those who, for whatever reason, are distant from the church, separated from the Eucharist. We pray that your grace reach them. We pray that the witness of those who love the Eucharist and celebrate it regularly will inspire them and touch their minds and hearts to return to the church and to receive from the Eucharist that which you alone can give, hope, life. Be with us now as, as an archdiocese. We enter into these priorities. May the efforts that we offer, our weak, humble efforts at formation, deepen our awareness of the great truths of the faith, our love for the faith, and our desire to share it with others. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you found it helpful along your, your journey of faith. Please know that I'm praying for you. And if you would, be so kind as to pray for us also. Every blessing to you. God bless. God bless.